Hi folks, this is a video on coastal landscapes. We're going to be looking at the first inquiry question today. Why are coastal landscapes different and what processes cause this change? So we're going to be thinking about what it is that causes a coastline to be different at different stages, whether that is going out into the sea or around an area, but also what processes are involved in creating this. Before we start, it is worth remembering that the coast is a dynamic equilibrium. Coastal areas are a dynamic equilibrium, which means they have to be in balance. If you take, say, the coast of Britain, which is our coast, all the way around you will have all kinds of processes going on. Some will be eroding, some will be depositing, some will be transporting, but they have to be in balance. If something's being eroded somewhere, it's being deposited somewhere else. If it's being deposited somewhere, it's being eroded somewhere else. And there's transport moving it all around. Now this can be around the country, it can be out into the ocean and back in again, but the point is it's always in dynamic equilibrium. So bear that in mind throughout the whole thing. One of the things that's probably worth starting with as well is what a coast actually is. A coastline is somewhere that experiences a tidal range. It's also got to be salt water and these processes have got to be occurring. Erosion, transportation, deposition within the area. If we're being a little more specific though, we can talk about the littoral zone. L-I-T-T-O-R-A-L. -T -T this is the littoral zone. And this is where coastal processes, as we understand them, are occurring. From in uh, right in land all the way to out to sea. There are five zones, if you like. There are four within the true littoral zone, but we're adding in a fifth one here. First stage in the littoral zone, offshore. Now this is right out into the ocean, high and low water line here, depending on the tide, are irrelevant because this area is always going to be submerged, right out to sea. Then we come into the near shore. Now at this point, both high and low water mark are still always above the seabed at every stage. So this is always submerged. However, the water is getting closer and closer to the land. So this is the near shore. Coastal processes are starting to happen. Offshore, they're not happening are starting to happen here. When we get into the foreshore, at low water, at low tide, this mark here, this area will be exposed. At high tide it will be submerged. So foreshore is like the transition spot. Submerged at high tide, exposed at low tide. So we get a lot of beach type processes occurring here or if it's an, a, uh, a rocky, destructive coastline, which I'll come back to later, then there'll be a different set of processes. But this is, if you think classic to the beach, for sure. Backshore. Now, the backshore is the point at which the low and high water line are always below the land. So at this point, we're looking at always out of the water. Now this doesn't mean that coastal processes aren't happening. They will be. But it's going to be less to do with the water, less to do with the marine, and more to do with the sub-aerial, which we are going to refer to in a little bit. And finally we get to the true coast, which is behind the back shore. This is the, uh, we've got the cliffs, and all that sort of thing. So this is the littoral zone, this is the zone we're talking about, and all kinds of things are happening within this area. 
Sometimes it'll be erosion, sometimes it'll be deposition, sometimes it will be transportation, or combinations of all these things. But the point is, the processes are happening out to sea, but they're also happening around the coastline. Now we're going to come across two different main types of, of coastline, rocky coasts and coastal plains. And these are very different, um, particularly in their profiles. Now you need to know the term cliff profile. That is the shape of the coast. So these two areas are very different from each other. For each of these cliff profiles, we have very different processes. On the rocky coast, you've got resistant rocks, high energy waves. What's happening is these waves are eroding against the cliffs and creating these very angular shapes. On the coastal plain, you tend to have low energy waves, so it tends to be more depositional. Additionally, you're going to have sediment coming in from rivers and other sub-aerial processes. Sub-aerial basically just means below the air, so it's land-based processes, whether that's rivers, which are technically on land rather than on the coast, sometimes it's the wind, and other types of weathering. And you get these smoother beach profiles. These tend to be lower energy, these tend to be higher energy, um, and these create the different types of coastlines that we see in the UK. So in terms of these cliff profiles, the shape of the two types of uh, cliffs, we're looking at two broad classifications, uh, particularly in the UK, but also around the world. We have rocky coasts, we have resistant rocks, and high energy destructive waves. What happens is the waves are attacking these resistant rocks and you get this very angular shape. So that's the one major type of cliff profile. The second is the coastal plain. Now this tends to be more depositional because it's lower energy waves, smoother, gentler cliff profile, and often the sediment coming in from sub-aerial processes. Now sub-aerial just means non-coastal, so it can be sediment from rivers. It can be sediment that's been eroded by the wind. Other types of weathering that cause sediment to get into the system. So broadly speaking, you've got low energy depositional coastal plains, and high energy erosive rocky coasts. Now these are not the only ways that you can classify coasts. We can also look at, as well as wave energy, we can look at tidal range. Is it very tidal, like you get in Bristol? Very, very large tidal range there. Sea level, is the sea level rising? So is the land basically sinking into the sea, like it is in Cornwall? Or is it emerging? Is it rising up, like we've got in particular parts of Scotland? How has it been formed? Is it erosion, deposition, transportation, or a combination? So these are the different types of classifications that we could be talking about. But when we're thinking about coasts, we're thinking about three major factors. We're thinking about, is it erosion or deposition that's causing the landscapes to be different? Or a combination of the two? And if so, is it marine erosion? So in the sea, or subaerial erosion. How resistant is the rock is number two, and number three is wave energy. High energy, we've got more erosion, or low energy, we get more deposition. In order to truly understand how these processes are occurring on the coast, we have to look at the geology and then even further and look at the lithology. So geology, looking at the, sort of the wider picture of the rock structure, lithology, then looking at the very particular rocks. So when we're looking at our rocky and our coastal plains, 
type coastlines, we need to be thinking about the geology. Now this can be broken down um, into uh, four types of but geological factors, if you like. The rock strata, so like bands of rock, whether they've been deformed, faulting, and dip. The strata are the bands, so if you've got, uh, where have we got the coastline here? I put on in green the less resistant rocks, softer types of rocks, more like clay, and black, something more resistant like a granite or maybe a limestone. The different strata are going to affect uh, different rates of erosion and also different types of deposition. Deformation. If tectonic activity has bent these strata, so rather than being straight, have they been bent? Not only from an aerial view, but also if we were to be looking at it as if we were looking straight at the coastline over there, have mountains been put in by folding and faulting collision boundaries? Check out my tectonics videos for that. Is there any faulting? Has the rock cracked? In any places. Have we got, in fact, I'll add on a crack because we're going to use it later. So here we go a crack in the rock, jointing or faulting. And also dip. Is the coastline pointing down into the water or is it pointing back up and out? All these factors affect what's happening, the level of erosion, level of deposition. Let's work through them. Strata. Let's imagine we've got water around these areas here. It's very much like the Isle of Purbeck in Dorset this. Now any waves that are coming in like this are going to be slamming into resistant rock. Black um, hatching is resistant rock. So very little is going to happen, at least to start with. However, anything that's getting in on this coastline is going to come across different types of rock. Now, should it be coming across a less resistant rock, you will find the coast gets eroded away. Here and here. This is because some strata are more resistant than others. So these strata wear away faster. So we get what's called differential erosion. Erosion at different rates. And this forms bays and headlands. Now the thing about those, of course, is that the headland and the bay will get different processes. What happens is headlands, if you've got a wave coming in, a headland will take the energy first and it'll sort of suck the waves around towards it. If you imagine if you've got a load of water that's coming along and there's a headland here, imagine where the headland was, here, the waves bend around it like a car hitting a post bends around it in a car crash. So the waves bend in towards the headland. So they're coming in and they're actually bending in. So the headland's taking the energy which allows beaches to build up in the bays. Now I'm going to talk about that in more detail in a different video, but the point is that the different types of geology mean that you've got bays forming and headlands forming. And then you get depositional features, you actually get coastal plains forming inside the bays because the energy, the high energy, is hitting the headlands. So a rocky 
coastal processes and rocky cliffs here, sorry, rocky cliff profiles, coastal plains and less resistant rocks. And this is all because of the geology. Slightly different on the concordant coastline, because at that stage you need to the waves need to get through somehow. So let's imagine this joint is allowing waves through. So this is where faulting comes in. If there's a fault, then it allows erosion to happen more. As soon as you put a crack in something, it becomes weaker. So if there's a gap in the rocks, if there's been an earthquake, or if there's just a crack because it's uh, uh, the rock is moving because of tectonic plates and it's just cracked a bit, it allows the water in. So now the waves, again, they're being focused onto the headland. Sun's going to work its way through here. And as soon as it gets to that less resistant rock, it's going to cut it away. And you end up with a bay forming within the resistant rock. And that can cut all of its way along there. So, combination of the faulting and the strata there creating a concordant coast or a discordant coast. Now, what about deformation? Well, let's imagine that there are uh, there's been some tectonic activity, two plates coming together like this. It's folded up some mountains. The sea level has risen since then, and the mountains have been submerged. What you might get is little peaks popping up. on the coastline, and those would be the tops of the mountains. But they're underwater now, so the water's making its way through. If you were to have that, you'd have what's called a Dalmatian coastline, where you've got, if you were to look at it sort of from straight on, looking from a boat straight at the coast, or perhaps from an, from an angle, you'd see that you've got rocks, which are deformed like that. And the water level is now here. So that would be if we were looking along that way. And you get that, you get what's called a Dalmatian coastline. If you've got a series of these mountains, you've got the Dalmatian coastline, but you can also get on concordant coastlines something called a half coastline, and that is where instead of getting mountains here, you get sand that has deposited itself along the coast and formed a sandbar. And in that case, that creates a half coastline, H-A-F-F. -F. So this is the types of concordant coastline that you might get. But it all comes down to geology. The one we haven't mentioned yet is dip. Whether the rocks are pointing in, or pointing back from the cliffs. Well, let's think about it. If you've got a series of layers of rock all on top of each other, and they're all pointing down, if you imagine the coast is over on this side, there's some erosion down here. The cliffs are much more likely to slide in, aren't they? Because all the weight is pushing down that way. Tip the cliffs backwards though, so different type of dip. If there's erosion processes down here, it's not going to affect the coast as much. The rock is still kind of leaning back, it's sitting back into the land, it's nice and stable. So it's pointing down, it's less stable, it's 
pointing back, it's more stable. So again, this affects it because if it's pointing downwards, you're more likely to get fast erosion. Pointing back, you get slower erosion processes. So we've got concordant and discordant coasts that can come from different geological structures. And subaerial processes affect it as well. So if we've got this dip, for example, and the types of erosion occurring there, but also on well any coastline, you're going to get three subaerial processes. You're going to get weathering, so you're going to get the effect of the rain, uh, cold, breaking up the rocks. Uh, actually, before we move on, yeah, the idea of the cold there is that freezing water, getting caught in cracks, then freezing expands, and when it melts, it contracts. So it cracks the rock apart as it freezes. Mass movements, so that's if there's a landslide. If you've got your dip pointing downwards, you might have a large scale movement of rocks. And also surface runoff. If you've got very heavy rain, storms, it can wash sediment, i.e. rock, off the top. So all of these processes going on, this is how the geological structure affects whether we get rocky cliffs, whether we get plains, and whether we get either concordant or discordant coastlines. So, to clarify the half coast, Dalmatian coast and dip. Dalmatian coast, just looking at this section to start with, here's the aerial view. You can sort of get these islands, got the rock strata here, looking straight down on it. But if you're looking at it from a sort of 3D view, you've got the ripples in the rock that came from folding from collision tectonics and it's in the resistant rock so you've still got these islands they haven't been eroded apart from where there's uh, joints and they're protecting the less resistant rock behind that's the dalmatian coast and all that's submerged so you just see the peaks of the mountains on the half coast slightly different process if you look down at this one here you've got water in here Resistant rock, less resistant rock. And what's happened is the less resistant rock has been eroded away. Like that. And a beach has formed, a bar, sorry, a, a bar of sand has formed on the outside. So what you've got there is there would have been some less resistant rock there originally. That got eroded away. The sand has built up on the outside and formed this bar. Here, the green stuff is the sand. And then the resistant rock is protecting the less resistant rock behind it. So there's sort of water through in there. Finally, with dip, this is a seaward dip, so pointing down towards the sea. So it's sliding down, less stable. This is a landward dip, so pointing back much more stable than the seaward dip. So let's zoom in now and have a look at the lithology. We've looked at the geology, the larger scale. We're going to zoom in now to the smaller scale. We need to think about four factors when we're thinking about the lithology and how that affects the coast. One, what is the rock type here? Is it igneous, sedimentary, metamorphic, is it consolidated or unconsolidated? Now, an igneous rock, a volcanic rock, is going to be the hardest, most resistant. Very, very tight structure, very dense, hard to erode. Sedimentary, because it's been built up from layers of sand pressed together, less resistant. It's not one single block of rock, it's been built up from sands, so it will erode faster. Metamorphic rocks, somewhere in the middle, because they tend to be sedimentary rocks that have been altered. They've been heated or compressed, so they become harder. It's got the hardest medium hardness 
and less hard in general. That's not a hard and fast rule, that's just in general. All of these are consolidated rocks. They've actually formed a type of rock. So there is a type of rock that is even less solid than those, and those are unconsolidated rocks. These have all been pressed together, made solid, but clay, boulder clay uh, or mudstone type rocks, they haven't been pressed together in the same way. They're not solid, they, they move, they're, s they're more like soil. So all of these three, even the sedimentary rock is much, much harder than an unconsolidated rock. So if we take our little diagram down at the bottom, Granite, it's an igneous rock, so that's barely going to erode. Chalk, however, is a sedimentary rock. So with wave action, it will erode faster. The other thing about chalk is that it's permeable. Permeable rock, if water can get into it, can permeate into it, going to become less stable because that water can break the bonds within the rock and it can increase the pressure so it can break it apart. Igneous rocks, metamorphic rocks, they're not permeable, certainly not in general. Sedimentary rocks are and unconsolidated rocks are very permeable. So, chalk will erode faster, but the unconsolidated clay compared to the chalk is going to erode very fast indeed because it's not a solid rock, it's permeable, it's going to break down. So these three factors can lead to basically the more permeable, the less consolidated, the quicker it's going to erode. Now you'll notice I haven't mentioned the vegetation. Is it suitable for vegetation? This is because vegetation is a little more tricky. It's a bit of a double-edged sword. Sometimes it holds the coast together, sometimes it doesn't. So we're going to explain that in a little more detail. So vegetation ha can have two different effects depending on whether we're looking at a rocky coast or coastal plains. Let's say we're looking at a rock, rocky coast to start with. We've got very steep cliff profile, plants growing with their roots, the roots can dig into the rock, crack it apart so it causes more erosion. Remember this is a high energy coast so it's going to cause more erosion and the plants are actually going to break it apart. They're going to break the rocks apart and they're going to fall in the plant's basically acting as a sub-aerial process. So on a rocky coastline, plants tend to be a cause of faster erosion. However, if we look at the coastal plain, we've got this longer profile, lower energy, and this is going to be sandy. Those roots actually hold together the sediments. The roots bind it together. So, in a low energy setting, the plants act to hold the coastline together and actually reduce any uh, erosion processes going on. So high energy, they can actually break the rock apart, but low energy, they can actually hold it together. So, the lithology is very important. Is it suitable for plants? If it's suitable, and it's a high energy coast, it can actually damage the coastline. If it's suitable and a low energy coast, it can actually improve the coastline. Of course, you get some rocks which aren't suitable at all. So they're not going to have to worry about it. So, vegetation has its impact as well. So overall, We've looked at how uh, various factors affect 
the resistance of the rock, so the geology and the lithology, how resistant is the rock and how is that going to affect concordant and discordant coasts. We've looked at wave energy, it's the high energy coastline, low energy coastline. We've looked at whether it's going to be an erosive, rocky cliff or coastal plains on a deposition, uh, deposition coastline. And all these work together in dynamic equilibrium. There's a rocky cliff somewhere, there'll be coastal plains somewhere else. There's erosion going on somewhere, there'll be deposition somewhere else. Whether it's between a headland and a bay, or whether it's somewhere much further along the coast. So, why are the coastal landscapes different? They are because of resistance of the rock, wave energy, and erosion and deposition. We've looked at all those processes that feed in to those three relatively simple concepts. If you've got any questions, let me know. Thanks for watching. Oh, by the way, if you were wondering about what types of erosion, what types of deposition, what types of transportation go on, don't worry, they'll be in the next video. Thanks for watching.